Whoa, welcome to AANHPI Heritage Month. I'm really looking forward to speaking to my guest today. She is an alchemist, dancer, visual artist, integrative life coach, tarot reader, and public speaker. After a serious mental, physical, and spiritual breakdown in 2019, she has been uh, made it her mission to be at the service of the divine and use her talents and personality to express and share herself from the frequency of joy. She also has a YouTube channel called Mel's Magic Official, where she shares her reflections and experiences on her ongoing journey of spiritual and aw awakening and self-discovery. I'd like to introduce you to Magic Mel. Yay. Wow, what an intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make some magic today. So could you share with everyone um, what's your cultural identity and a little bit about yourself? Mm -hmm. Yes. So my mother is Filipina and my father was German. So I'm bicultural at least. And I grew up well in partly in Germany and then in Spain. Mm. Yes. And what was yeah. the second question? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's just a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I'm a trained visual artist, a painter, as you can see, it's one of my paintings in the back. Actually, it's several here. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess at the moment, I'm really just tuning into my creativity and allowing it to come out in any way it wants. So that's why the YouTube channel also and the dancing and the singing, I'm really tapping into that. And like you said, you know, channeling into the joy and expressing that, allowing it to free flow. Whereas in the past, I was very blocked, you know, I'm very, very blocked. And now I'm just like, okay, let it out and be joyful in the process and hopefully bring other people some joy from from me being in that frequency mm -hmm. and i want to say like i love your kisamba dancing <laughs> <laughs> you see yes you see everything i mean i'm really throwing myself into you know the moment for example the dancing thing i was completely unexpected but whereas in the past i wouldn't follow my intuitive nudges this time I'm like, okay, if my body, if my intuition says go, then I dive straight into it for as long as the energy tells me to, you know, mm -hmm. and good things come out of that. Yeah, for sure. Would you, so we're talking about overcoming guilt and expectation today. And I know like in the introduction, you were talking about a little bit of the um, challenges you were facing back in 2019 could you share a little bit with us like how the two linked to each other and why you chose to um, talk about this topic today with us yeah I feel it's a, a topic that's affecting a lot of us you know I mean it can be we can talk about it within our cultural context but I feel so many of us are going through that now working letting go of our old stories of these heavy emotions guilt and really trying to sift through, there's an expression of sift through the wheat or the shaft, like what belongs to me and what belongs to somebody else? Like, where do I draw the line? And of course, cultural, our cultural context kind of forges us you now from, from our childhood. So I guess, you know, like my mom, I mean, she's Filipina. She was kind of a pioneer for her age. She was like the traveler and the first one to move to Europe, but I do feel that I had to work myself out of these stories that I grew up with in. No? So the story was very much, I guess the, the guilt, you know, it's something I, I, I kind of not integrated, but took onto myself because first, okay, talking like super deep childhood, I, I think I always... I was so enmeshed, like my, my own sense of self was so enmeshed with that of my parents, and it's normal enough for children, that I, I felt guilty that I couldn't make my parents happy. And of course, that's not something that a child is responsible for, but we internalized, that was, that's the word I was looking for. I internalized that and I took it on my shoulders. So the sense of guilt, I feel, was very much rooted from the, that very early moment where I felt responsible for making them happy. Mm -hmm. and knowing also that later on took more momentum because you know I realized that my mom would had really sacrificed herself she really worked so hard to to provide me this yeah life of privilege you no know, good education 
and growing up in a place, just kind of reinventing her own life and, and to give me a good upbringing. No? So I felt like, oh, there's an added layer of guilt. Like I better make something out of myself because my mom sacrificed so much. And yeah, and I think guilt and expectation, there's, they come together. You know? So <laughs> the expectation then that I put on myself is like, okay, I better prove that it was worthwhile her sacrifice her hard work was worthwhile no mm -hmm. and seeing well that's something i disentangle later on seeing that this survival mode or this yeah scarcity mentality you know it kind of really went in, into myself too where i was like okay i have to work hard now i have to work hard i have to study hard I have to, you know, make the best out of it. And it can always be double-edged sword. I mean, I guess it's good to have ambition, but where is it coming from? And for me, because of that early enmeshment and fragile sense of self, and um, I, I operated more from a void rather than a sense of confidence and wholeness. Mm -hmm. So my entire life I had to, I've worked on disentangling myself from this guilt that always haunted me, you know, this, you know how guilt feels like it's this deep sinking feeling which i guess is it's useful for when we do make a mistake you know our consciousness or our conscience tells us hey you better look at maybe maybe you did something wrong maybe you caused some pain you better look at what you did but if we have it as this really internalized just blanket feeling that we cannot get rid of it just dampens everything and talking about joy you know it, it's a it's a joy killer because it's so heavy the the feeling of guilt uh yeah. it resonates so much to with me also because with me with my parents giving up everything in hong kong and moving here in 1991 and it's their constant working full-time and constant um, taking care of the family so it comes from they have sacrificed so much like this idea with immigrants right that our parents have sacrificed so much to give us the opportunity so don't mess it up right? <laughs> don't mess it up make sure that you are able to provide and also like with my parents I am really blessed that they don't feel the, the um, they don't verbally say you have to take care of us. And of, of course, like we will still take care of them, like my brother and I, and I, but like, it, there are a lot of, so like a cultural upbringing where the parents still verbally say that I expect the kids to repay that, to take care of me. And it was very like clear with my grandma like with my dad's side of the family she when my dad was growing up he was expected to go out to work to take care um to bring in the money to take care of the family like um giving his younger siblings a chance to go to school and all those things but then her expectation is once everyone is self-sufficient then the second brother is expected to take care of her and the and the dad right so it's all of these things that are very verbally explicit that gets put onto us so it's like this layer with a generational tra trauma that we are expected to repay and it's not and it's a very of course part of it is from love but when it goes over that boundary, it becomes this obligation. And so it's like an expectation, this guilt of not wanting to, and then this resentment of like, why do I have to, right? So it's like all of these things that is like a very blatant emotion that gets put onto us, but we have no words to bring it out because it's like if we feel trapped to do that. And like, it really resonates with me. <laughs> yeah. you know that's why it's so important I feel to take our feelings seriously you know so if we I mean you I agree you know it was so difficult to actually disentangle or to even understand what I would that what I was feeling was guilt so before I used to be so emotionally emotionally illiterate I didn't really understand even my own emotions my feelings so once I started looking at that and a friend of mine pointed out she's like Mel you always you always feel guilty you carry the world on your shoulder and then i you know i started to look at my inner landscape and then when i realized oh it was guilt 
And when, when I investigated, that's when I understood, okay, what, what the underlying belief is and what the expectation is. So I feel, you know, for us to really sit with our emotions and accept them and then be like a detective to investigate, okay, what beliefs fuel this feeling or this emotion to understand even what, what the beliefs are, you know, what, what our operation operating system is. I feel that's so important. And as I said, that was a way for me to actually figure out, oh, I feel guilty because of this narrative that I've internalized and these expectations. And I guess for me, it was more, more, more subtle, mm, maybe because of this okay, mixed European and then mixed Filipino, there was always this, I always had to try and figure out, well, what do I resonate with? You know, I have these two cultures clashing there. Yeah. But I remember, you know, one of my dreams also where three years ago, to maybe two years ago, where in the dream, I asked myself, oh my God, you know, my age, my mom already had two children. She had built two houses and it's almost comparing my, my life to her life. And like, what have I built? And putting even more guilt and expectations on myself. Mm. And I feel it's important for us to really, you know, separate that and see that each generation has their own challenges and we're you know like we're doing we're very much asked to really shift paradigms no and look at these old beliefs and deconstruct them and see well what is still valuable for me what am i carrying what serves me how can i carry this forward yeah. without without the heavy emotions mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about this your two identity right what are some of the things that you find that kind of made you become aware of like, okay, there's this Asian part of you, this Filipino part, part of you that is very like in a, like against this German part of you in terms of like bringing out this awareness? Yeah, I mean, I have to make a disclaimer. Maybe I'm going to generalize a bit and be a bit stereotypical, but you know, some cultural stereotypes, I'm speaking from my own experience, no, are true. No? So there was very much this, the rational, the thinking, the deeping, almost like brooding type, that's kind of more the, I would, the German type, no, but almost like overthinking part in me. And then there was the, the emotionalness I was always, um, I guess, attracted and repelled to from, from my mom, because she was very emotional. Like, and it almost scared me also. I'm like, okay, I, I escaped into the mind. It's feel, felt safer because we can, you know, the abstract is more, yeah, can deal with the abstract more than with these crazy emotions. So, yeah, I mean, if it was, I guess, you know, now looking back, it's, I, I choose to look at it as a blessing because I, you're being exposed to like a, like a buffet of different perceptions. I, I always think that a culture is like a window, different window onto humanity. So being, able to grow up with two windows yeah. you know, two different ways of looking at things but it was difficult like often I would feel in conflict because especially you know the parent situation you love them both and if the situation is such that they antagonize each other then you also feel like well who do I identify with and it's almost like a black and white thing oh my god do I have to decide if am I more German am I more Filipino it was very difficult mm and complex to integrate that for myself because you know we're talking about emotional psychological cultural and then what you're exposed to at home yeah it's quite yeah. complex but I guess like I said the beautiful thing is you can choose then what serves me how what do I want to take on from the German culture and what do I want to take on from the Filipino culture and not compare it in terms of one is better than the other yeah. you know it's not about better it's just different it's two completely different ways of looking lifestyles looking at things and trying to merge it in your being mm -hmm. I love do you know what Mel like when you were talking about um the different types of personality between what we deem like is a culture but it's not because right because for myself with a lot of my Chinese culture a lot of times we don't show the emotions 
Mm-hmm. So I'm very surprised. So, so like as you can see, like even just within this con- uh, conversation, like you can see, it's not the culture. It's it's actually a person. Like within one culture, we are all the same, right? We have a spectrum of people who are very logical versus people who are very emotional, and it's within that one culture. Because for my mom, she is very logical, always go go go, and if you want to do something, you go ahead with it. If you can't, then like you weak and and you know like and I'm the one who is always crying. So and and whenever I have to stand up to my mom, tell her something, I start crying, and she'll be like, "Why are you crying?" Right? <laughs> so mm-hmm. so it's very much of that, um, and it, it's and we don't really say "I love you" to each other. It's like more like of a subtle way of like being in service of each other, sacrificing ourselves. So th- those kind of things is what I personally identify as. A Chinese culture, right? So, like for Mel, it's very different, right? Because her own parents is very different. So, so even in in itself, like the culture is in its a one culture, it's so diverse. So there is no like when we're talking about the stereotypical thing, there's no such thing because it's like what we think it means, right? So it's like so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> no, and thank you for pointing it out. That's it's so important to. You know, even in my own discourse, to remember like everything is specific, no specific situations, yeah. specific people. Um, I guess even the Filipino, you know, Filipinos. I guess we're so different from. Diff- I mean, I used to live in Thailand. Also, the, cu- the Asian cultures are so completely different. We're like the Filipinos are more the Latinos of <laughs> of Asia. No, so compared to Ch- I went to China once. I'm like, wow, it's like so different. It's like another yeah. planet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I feel it's really, like you said, actually, it's important to be exposed to these different ways of looking at things and realize, okay, they're all valid. It's just different, you know, and we need to make sense. We need to integrate it for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I love when you said that with you being with like parents of two different backgrounds coming together, you get to see the windows. And for me, I like, even though when I first came to Canada, immigrated here I hated it like the experience I like I am so grateful for that experience if you ask me do I want to go back to live that life again no no way (laughs) but like I am very blessed to have that opportunity because it allowed me to like take me out of that water right Mm -hmm. and into another different environment so that I get to see how my parents operate versus what is out there in the world? So my mind is always questioning, like, what is success? What is, like, what is our identity? Like, right, so because my mom and my dad, they're very much focused on, okay, this is how you're supposed to live life, right? But it's like, is it really true? And it opens me up to these windows to say, hey, maybe it's not true, because if it's true, then other people will be living like that too, right? So... Yeah, it's like all of these things we become aware because of that opportunity. Yeah, yeah I think it's really having this mindset, no, um, of asking ourselves questions, not taking things just, um, like you said, as a given to really make an inquiry. What serves me? Oh, what, there was a point I wanted to make. Oh, yes. What I, what I do felt was important is to really, you know, I was lucky that we went back to the Philippines a lot, so at least once a year, that I I really had contact with my Filipino side. And I made it a point also to learn um, Tagalog. My mom, actually, interestingly enough, she didn't teach me what she does claim. When I tell her nowadays, she says, yes, I taught you, said, ma. <laughs> but I made it a point when I was um, a teenager to, to learn the language. Her argument was, well, I didn't teach you because you don't need it outside of the Philippines. But I'm like, that's not a good, I mean, that's not good enough. I want to learn the language because it's part of me and I will understand the culture better if I speak the language. I will, I will be able to immerse myself better, no? So I made a a conscious effort to relate as much as possible. Mm. I did have a chance to live longer in the Philippines, but then that was 2019, but then I had my, yeah, I was resisting a lot of personal, the universe was pushing me, well, <laughs> guiding me in one direction, I was resisting, so that didn't happen, that's why I ended up back in Spain, mm. and I, I treasure the, yeah, the heritage mm-hmm. that, that I make, I, I guess through my heart, you know, 
Mm -hmm. so. Going back to the guilt and resentment and the mm -hmm. expectations, could you share with us, like, I know you already touched upon this, but for people who haven't really done this kind of work, what kind of tips do you have for them to actually start off on this journey? I feel it's back to basics, you know, sitting with ourselves, creating some space. So creating some space for self-awareness. I feel it's so important to sit, accept what we're feeling first, you know, like resentment, uh, guilt, those are all, how does that feel in the body? And, and what is that feeling? So first identify what we're feeling. I think that's the point number one. And then, as I said earlier, is to really, you know, we feel a certain way because of a thought usually. So to trace that feeling back to the belief, the thought that's, that's fueling that feeling is crucial because then we can, it's like digging up something from maybe that's a little bit buried, digging it up and looking at it. So for example, the guilt, guilty feeling was tied to my belief that I was just not making my parents happy that, you know, that whatever I was doing, it was not really proving uh, my appreciation or my, yeah, my capacity and all of that. So once I discovered that belief, I'm like, wow, where did that, where did that come from? You know, so it's kind of peeling off this, these layers and, and the stimulus is the feeling and you can then understand yourself better by following that feeling, following, uh, discovering the belief and then sitting with it, you know, with your present state, like, okay, where does this come from? Does this come from childhood? Does this come from my mom, from my culture, you know, with that expectation? And how do I now choose to relate to that expectation? Do I choose to still take it on board and put it on me? Or do I say, you know what, as you said earlier, it might work for some people, but it doesn't work for me. Like I choose to release myself from this and yeah, act or choo choose a different belief. So it really, I feel it's really going back to basics and following our feelings and using those feelings for what they're there for. No, they're guides mm -hmm. to tell us. Well, when we feel good, it's you know, compass is pointing that way. If we feel heavy emotions, there's something else going on. Mm, I happening? love that because, yeah, um, I mean, even with Cindy and I, Cindy Ho and I were talking about, it's like that space first, that space for you to bring yourself aware with yourself, um, bring your awareness back onto yourself. And it's so important because when we are with other people, there are so much of these things that are right around us. We feel like our parents is always looking over our shoulders, our our, our spouse, or our kids is always latched onto us, dependent on us. So we never really have a space to breathe. So what Mel said is like, give yourself that space, right? Giving yourself that space so you can breathe and then you can look at the feeling. And what she said is really important. It's like, we think that we're having this feeling because we think that, oh, my mom never allowed me to do this or they depend on me so that I feel so trapped. But it's not, it's really a thought about those things that's creating that feeling. And so when we are able to tease that out, then you'll be like, oh, it's just a thought. But because I've been thinking about it for so long that it became a belief and then examine and question whether we really want to hold on to that. And it's so powerful. When I first learned about this, it was like, holy, what do you mean, right? But it's like, and, and, and I think I want to share about like being able to sit with it and not judge ourselves for it. Because yeah. there were so many times I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking about this again. <laughs> and I have so much judgment um, of wanting to move on or like not feeling good enough. And I was still holding on to this thought and having this feeling. But it's okay to be right here, giving myself the space to grow out of it. And yeah, it's so powerful. Anything yeah. else you would like to share? Because I, I know you love to talk about this, like the inner childhood, the inner child, bring that joy. I really want to touch upon this 
because this is your forte. <laughs> yeah, you know, you said something interesting. I just wanted to expand on a little bit also, where you said, "Oh, you hear, you might hear your mother's voice or different voices." That is also part of the work. You know, one thing is looking at our emotions, but then once you sit with yourself, like you said, you create some space for yourself just to relate with yourself, what your thoughts are, and also to identify these narrators, so these voices. Who is speaking? Is it, like you said, is it, it might be my mom, it might be my boss. So to actually disengage and see it as not you, but a voice, and then again, create some space. You can, I mean, there's so many different techniques, so you can do parts work. Parts work is where you literally take that, <laughs> that aspect of you or that voice and have a conversation. Let's say it's the internalized voice of your mom have a conversation, okay, because it's not always possible in real life due mm -hmm. to circumstances, but yeah. to relate in that sense okay, and relate differently. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the important thing in this entire process, I feel, is really to distill who is you, like this path of individuation, like who is myself mm -hmm. in relation to all of these voices, these aspects, my cultures, my context, my upbringing, but who out of all of this, what am I taking on board? What resonates with me? And when you realize that, you know, I, I was not always this joyful before this breakdown in 2019, where I really had to, talking about creating space and looking at things, I really had to spend three years to deal with these voices and this baggage that I was carrying. But once I realized I have the choice to let it go and to choose something differently. I felt freer. Mm -hmm. And when we feel freer, and it's kind of to do with vibrations also, our vibration rises and joy is up there, no? And I feel it's, it's, it's actually the joy of coming back home to yourself. You know, mm -hmm. after having done all of this investigation relating yeah. to these different voices, hey, okay, I know who you are. I'm, you know, you can all talk, but I know who I am in my heart and I allow myself to be joyful again you know so it's almost like it's almost like going back to being a child but it, not in the childish sense more like in the you know the innocence of a child where we marvel at the world and everything is magical everything is fresh every day is special because we're not burdened anymore by these stories and expectations guilt resentment that we as adults accumulate not from childhood on so for me the joy is very much to do to with releasing the expectations the guilt the resentments and being comfortable and at home and connected to ourselves you know the joy naturally comes out of it I love it. And like, you know what, as you're talking, like I have goosebumps and because like for the longest time when I was growing up, my, my question to myself is always, what's the purpose of me being on this world, right? What's the purpose of me being on this world? But the truth is we are born here and, and there has got to be a purpose because the percentage of the probability of us being born is so slim so there has to be, be a purpose but the purpose is really just to be ourselves right when we were born we are this way like if you think back to being a kid right like when you're two or three or even my son is six right now he has his own little personality there are things that he loves to explore. There are things that he he just like to do. You don't have to, you don't, he doesn't have to like think too much, right? And that's the purpose, like you coming back to who you are. Because when we grow up, we have these experiences and we do need these experiences to actually find out who we are, right? And they are, they're, they're sometimes so painful, right? It's like, that's why I, even I said, like, I didn't want to go back to that thing. But those are the experiences that made me who I am. So now I get to like tease out, okay, I want to keep this part. I don't want to keep this part. I just like, and choose how I want to show up, how I want to live. And, and for Mal, it's like, she wants to tap into that magical, like happy, joyful self, which I always love <laughs> seeing. <laughs> And I'm also working on that, right? Finding fun, finding joy. It's not something that I grew up with, right? So <laughs> I feel it's something we, we, like you said, you know, it's this journey of we're born whole and then slowly our ego forms and we go into separation and then 
disintegration and we get fragmented into all these voices, expectations, our energy, our consciousness goes all over the place. And then we rebuild, reclaim, reconnect with ourselves. So it's this beautiful, like, that's why al alchemical process, no, of disintegration and then and uh, synthesize, synthesis again and more consciously. And like you said, the contrast was necessary. There's the, you know, the Buddhist image of the lotus. I mean, it's cliche, but the lotus out of the mud. Everything serves a, a purpose. And again, I wouldn't be this joyful either if I hadn't gone through my personal hell, you know? Mm -hmm. And the hell is a reminder. It's kind of not in the back of my mind, but it's it's an experience that, that I look back to. And I always tell myself, I am not going back there. I know what hell fe felt like. And I choose consciously every day to be joyful because it's this privilege of having gone through this journey and back again it's yeah yeah, yeah the lotus is like so fitting right because it only grows in that muddy water and it's so beautiful once it blooms it's like that's the purpose for you to bloom, to be who you are, to hold on to what's dearest to you and to let go of all the things that don't serve you, right? And you get to choose. And I think a lot of times when I was growing up too, it's like, I just felt like I was trapped. I had no other choice. And I always wanted to start over and over and over. But like, that doesn't help me because I needed to go through this process, right? So choosing you, being you, tapping into you and accepting everything yeah and you know giving yourself <laughs> i have to laugh because giving yourself the grace of of patience and i i'm laughing because i'm not the most patient person but Me neither. <laughs> you know so I, it's like okay i'm telling you but i'm telling myself also but really it's this process that maybe has its own dynamic and we sometimes force things like you said okay you want you know we want the result now but it has its own own processing and we just have to keep at it, but just allow ourselves to return to it, return to the lesson. Like one of the big lessons in terms of letting go of guilt was literally, you know, when I moved back here in 2019, I lived with my mom for three years also, which was really confronting <laughs> after so many years living back with her and there was this guilt. And we had so many fights because I almost didn't, I, I almost, I told her, you know what? I don't, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but I was, I was like, I don't, there's no point in being nice to you now because all these years we had so, like, I screwed up too much. So what's the point in being nice to you now? And she's like, Melanie, let it go. She even told me, let go of the guilt. She said, you have to give yourself permission to let go. So as, it's almost like you, you said, it's a choice. I was resisting the choice. I was holding on and almost beating myself up. It's like, you don't deserve to to be free of this you don't deserve to be happy because you were so bad in the past i'm like yeah. <gasps> judging myself you know yeah. it was really this process of at some point i said do you still do you love yourself enough to let this go or not that was a question yeah. oh my gosh <laughs> i thinking about that like, I've, I've caused my mom so much pain <laughs> and and yeah it's like letting myself feel that forgiveness to say hey like I still get to mend that relationship and I still get to and, and it's like all of those things that happened everyone is just doing the best right from what they knew at that moment and there were things that I knew my mom did that really hurt me and I knew there were a lot of things that I did that really hurt her and knowing that going forward, I could let myself go toward that. It's so powerful. Ooh, so much yeah. stuff. That and you know, the beautiful <laughs> thing is once we, I felt once I chose to let it go, I felt lighter, freer, and automatically my relationship with my mom improved because I wasn't looking at her through my guilty spectacles, you know, with so much resentment and heavy emotions. All of a sudden it was like, ah, oh, we're free. And she also told me, my God, you know, finally our, our, our energy is different. So loving ourselves and, and forgiving ourselves, actually, it's, it's for our highest good, but it also affects our other relationships automatically. So mm. it's so important. Mm. Oh, our conversation is coming to an end. Is there one more thing you would like to share with the audience before we wrap up? I just say, like, trust the process. 
trust the process, even when things are difficult, especially when things are difficult and when things don't seem to make sense, keep on leaning in, I'd say, you know, leaning in, making space for yourself and leaning into your emotions. Get, try to understand what you're feeling and why you're feeling it like that and take it from there. Trust that what you're feeling is valid, but you can, by understanding them, choose. Choose a different thought, a different belief that will then help you to feel better. That was my advice. And I want to add to that. It's like, it's never too late, no matter where you are. And like when, when Mel was talking about, I'm not patient, like I am not patient, right? And also, because with me going on this journey, I'm meeting with a lot of people who are way much younger than I am. And I'm like, holy crap. Like if I had known this, like when I was in my twenties, I would be like off the charts, right? <laughs> but then I need it to be where I am. And there's no good time, bad time. It's just where you are. And if this conversation or if at any point in time, there's something that resonates with you, just hold on to it because that is the perfect moment for you to just get back into yourself. And there's no good time, no bad time, no too early, no too late. And it's just the perfect time. So thank you so much, Mel. If other people would like to work on themselves, bring out that inner child joy, how can they work with you? How can they find you? I've got my website up and running, but you can also find me on my Instagram, on Facebook, and yeah, I, and oh, my YouTube channel, very important, my YouTube channel, Mel's Magic yeah. Official, where I also have all my contact information there. Mm, okay, so thank you so much again, Mel. Thank you also, <laughs> I thank love you. our conversation. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, later. thank you. Bye, Claudia. Bye.